Chapter Seven of Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales by Elliot O'Donnell. Chapter Seven The Gisborough Ghost, or a minute account of the appearance of the ghost of John Croxford executed at northampton august the fourth seventeen sixty four for the murder of a stranger in the parish of gisborough part one preface the publication from which the following extracts are taken was printed at northampton where the original may still be seen august nineteen o eight in the year seventeen sixty four it appears that the author who was officiating there as temporary chaplain to the jail was a man of indisputable and well-known integrity and a very popular preacher throughout the country in order to render his work useful and instructive innumerable references are made to the scriptures but his quotations are of too great a length for the following abridged tract which is copied from the original and contains only the account of the interview the author had with croxford's ghost the ghost it appears from the account given in a pamphlet reprinted and sold by G. Henson, letterpress and copperplate printer, Bridge Street, Northampton, 1848, that on Saturday, August the 4th, 1764, John Croxford, together with three others of the names of Seamark, Deacon and Butlin, were tried at the assizes of Northampton and convicted of murder. It came out at the trial that the unfortunate victim was a native of Scotland, travelling with goods, and that by chance he called at the house of Seamark, a shepherd's hut in the parish of Gisborough, Northamptonshire, where Croxford and his companions used to meet, where they robbed and afterwards cruelly murdered him, and in order to prevent a discovery consumed his body in an oven, which was proved on the evidence of one of Seamark's children, who was an eye-witness to the transaction, by looking through the crevices of the floor from the room above. They were all found guilty and executed on August 4, 1764, and Croxford's body hung in chains at Hollowell Heath, in the parish of Gisborough, near the spot where the horrid deed was perpetrated, and no spot more suggestive of such a tragedy could be imagined. The author of the work, at that time, 1764, holding the appointment of chaplain to the Northampton jail, after quoting passages from various writers to prove the reality of the subject, proceeds to give an account of the appearance of Croxford's ghost as follows. I shall now proceed without further let or impediment to a plain and conscientious account of the ghost or apparition which was the occasion of my troubling the world with this narrative, unless I first observe that the behaviour of the prisoners, one of whom is the subject of these pages, lately tried, condemned and executed at northampton for the murder of a person unknown upon the evidence of anne seamark and her son about nine or ten years old was such as astonished every beholder clear and conclusive as the evidence was against them no arguments even after condemnation though delivered and enforced with the utmost energy precision and perspicuity by a learned and worthy divine were able to reach their hardened hearts and prevail for an open and unreserved confession of their guilt even at the gallows in their last address to the people they insisted on their innocence in the strongest terms imaginable wishing the heaviest penalties an offended god could inflict might be their portion in the next world if they were guilty of the murder that was laid to their charge and for which they were about to suffer thus did they divide the sentiments of the crowd that many were brought over to a full persuasion of their innocence while others were left halting between two opinions and severely agitated with conflicting doubts but mark the event after having instructed my people as a teacher in the knowledge of the scriptures i used to spend the superfluous hours of the lord's day in perusing some part or other of the old and new testament accordingly on august the twelfth seventeen sixty four being the sabbath i returned as usual into my study the door of which is secured by a lock with a spring bolt and sat down to my accustomed evening devotion 
the business of this day by rotation laying in the new testament and in that part of it where st paul in his epistle to the corinthians proposes maintains and proves the resurrection of the body struck with the sublimity of his thoughts boldness of his figures and energy of his diction and convinced by the number and weight of his arguments and looking with a pleasing foretaste of happiness into futurity i was on a sudden surprised with the perfect form and appearance of a man who stood erect at a small distance from my right side conscious that the door was locked and that there was no other means by which my visitor could have entered i was considerably surprised surprise turning into abject terror when glancing with irresistible fascination at the man i perceived in him something indefinably but most unmistakably unnatural feeling sure that i was in the actual presence of an apparition i contrived by an almost superhuman effort i admit to sum up sufficient courage to speak my voice seeming dry and unrecognisable i addressed it in the power and spirit of the gospel inquiring on what errand it was sent what was intended by such an application and what services could be expected from a person of so little note and mean abilities as myself i must here state that although the spectre had inspired me with so much awe i did not associate it with anything evil every second tended to strengthen my composure and when it spoke in a voice rather more hollow and intense perhaps than that of a human being my fears were instantly dissipated i was now able to take a close stock of it and observed that in features general appearance and clothes it closely resembled any ordinary labouring man it was an expression and colouring only it differed its eyes were lurid its cheeks livid raising one extremely white and emaciated hand it desired me to compose myself saying that it was now strictly limited by a superior power and could do no one act but by the permission of god i had no reason to be afraid abrupt as was its appearance and that if i would endeavour to overcome the visible perturbation i was in it would proceed in the business of its errand at this announcement my heart fluttered with an excitement i found difficult to control was the wonderful mystery that had hitherto enshrouded the existence and composition of the unknown about to be revealed to me was i going to be initiated into those secrets heretofore denied to man eagerly promising to compose myself and lost to all else save the fascinating presence of my guest i settled down to listen to anything the phantasm might have to say the room i must here state was lighted by a single though rather powerful double wick oil lamp which i had always deemed sufficient to illuminate the whole apartment but which now and i could not help noticing the phenomenon did not extend its rays beyond the cadaverous face of my intruder upon which the full force of its light seemed concentrated commencing in clear and solemn tones the phantasm stated that it was one of the unhappy prisoners executed at northampton on the fourth of august seventeen sixty four a cold chill ran down my back at this announcement which was intensified when i recognised for the first time that the figure confronting me bore a startling likeness to one of the prisoners it had been my unhappy lot to address prior to his execution there was the same hair brows and beard black and stubby and protruding forehead and retreating chin that had so repelled me the mouth-shaped head and the broken unsavoury-looking teeth it was indeed the ghost of one of those diabolical miscreants that stood before me and despite the fact that i was brought up in the strict protestant faith i inadvertently crossed myself the spectre went on without apparently heeding my action it has been so it proclaimed the principal and ringleader of the gang most of whom it had corrupted debauched and seduced to that deplorable method of life and it was particularly appointed by providence to undeceive the world and remove those doubts which the solemn protestations of their innocence to the very hour of death had raised in the minds of all who heard them at this juncture excitement overcoming fear and aversion i hazarded to inquire of the phantasm its name its reply delivered in the same slow measured almost mechanical tones as if it were only the mouth organ of some other and unseen agency was to the effect that its name was john croxford that it had expressed directions to come to me directions it could not disobey 
it furthermore explained the reason the murderers had so persistently insisted on their innocence lay in the fact that while the blood of their victim was still warm they entered into a sacramental obligation which they sealed by dipping their fingers in the blood of the deceased and licking the same by which they bound themselves under the penalty of eternal damnation never to betray the fact themselves nor to confess if condemned to die for it on the evidence of others and that they were further encouraged to such measures since as c mark himself was a confederate in the murder they concluded the evidence of his wife would not be admitted that as the child was so young they presumed no judge or jury would pay the least regard to his depositions that as butlin had but lately entered into a confederacy with them and no robberies could be readily proved against him they thought it would appear impossible for one of his age to begin a career of wickedness with murder it being observed in a proverb that no man is abandoned all at once that if they could invalidate the evidence on behalf of butlin it must be of equal advantage to them all that though disappointed in this view in court and condemned to die upon the above evidence they were still infatuated with the same notion even at the gallows and expected a reprieve for butlin when the halter was about his neck and consequently if such a reprieve had been granted as the evidence was as full and decisive against butlin as against them the sentence for the murder must have been withdrawn from all their execution deferred and perhaps transportation only their final punishment though listening to every word with abnormal attention i became at the same time aware of a strange and uncanny feeling that the identity of the phantasm was but partly revealed to me in the corpse-like figure opposite what its true and entire nature might be i dared not even hazard a conjecture in the pause that followed its last speech more to hear myself speak than anything else i could not endure the silence of this thing i asked if the evidence of the woman and child was clear punctual and particular to which it replied it was as circumstantial distinct and methodical as possible varying not in the least from truth in any one particular of consequence unless in the omission of their horrid sacrament which she might possibly neither observe nor know i then asked why they had behaved with such impropriety imprudence and clamour upon their trial to which it replied that they had been somewhat elevated with liquor privately conveyed to them and that by effrontery and a seemingly undaunted behaviour they hoped to intimidate the woman throw her into confusion perplex her depositions thereby rendering the evidence precarious and inconclusive or at least give the court some favourable presumptions of their innocence i next inquired whether they knew the name of the person murdered whence he came and what reasons they had for committing so horrid a barbarity to which the phantasm answered that the man was a perfect stranger to them all that the murder was committed more out of wantonness and the force of long contracted habits of wickedness than necessity as they were at that time in no want of money that they first found occasion to quarrel with the peddler through a strange propensity to mischief for which it could not account but from god's withdrawing his grace and leaving them to all the extravagance and irregularities of a corrupted heart long hardened in the ways of sin and the man being stout and undaunted resented their ill usage and in his own defence proceeded to blows that two only deacon and croxford were at first concerned but finding him resolute they had called up seamark and butlin who were at a distance behind the hedge that they then all seized the peddler notwithstanding which he struggled with great violence to the very last against their united efforts nor did they think it safe to trifle any longer with a man who gave such proofs of uncommon strength that with much difficulty they dragged him down to seamark's yard and there committed the murder as represented in court i next asked if there was any license in his bags or pockets that they might discover his name or place of abode it replied no that the paper left behind in its croxford's writing was of a piece with the rest of their conduct in this affair a hardened untruth abounding with reflections as false as scandalous and wicked suggested by the father of lies who had gradually brought them from one step of iniquity to another beginning first in the violation of morality 
to the place of purgatory in which they now were it further declared a statement that interested me greatly that though their bodies were unaffected with pain their souls were in darkness under all the dreadful apprehensions of remaining there for eternity far beyond what the liveliest imagination while influenced by the weight of grossness of matter can conceive that their doom had been not a little aggravated by their final impenitence impiety and profaneness in adjuring god by the most horrid imprecations to attest the truth of a palpable and notorious falsehood and by wishing that their own portion in eternity might be determined in consequence thereof language the apparition said was too weak to describe and mortality incapable of conceiving a ten thousandth part of their anguish and despair even at present and happy would it be for succeeding ages if posterity could be induced to profit by their misfortunes and be influenced by this account to avoid the punishment of the earth-bound all this the phantasm delivered with such increased distinction and perspicuity with such an emphasis and tone of voice as plainly evinced the truth of what it spoke and claimed my closest attention and regard and as it seemed to hint that i was singled out to acquaint the world with these particulars i told it that the present age was one of incredulity and agnosticism that few gave credit to fables of this kind that the world would conclude me either a madman or impostor or brand me with the odious imputations of superstition and enthusiasm that therefore true credentials would be necessary not only to preserve my own character but also to procure respect and credit to my relations to this the phantasm instantly responded that what i observed was perfectly right and requisite to authenticate the truth of this affair and that unless some proper attestations were given to accounts of this nature they would be considered by the rational part of mankind as mere tales invented only to amuse the credulous or frighten children on a winter's evening into temper and obedience in short that they would have no weight and disappoint the ends of providence who intends them for the good and benefit of the world that therefore in order to encourage my perseverance in supporting the truth of this appearance and embolden me to publish a minute detail of it it would direct me to such a criterion as would put the reality of it beyond all dispute and it accordingly told me that in such a spot describing it as minutely as possible in the parish of gisborough was deposited a gold ring which belonged to the peddler whom they murdered and moreover in the inside was engraved this singular motto hanged he'll be who steals me that on perusing it the apparition continued it croxford had been smitten with grave apprehensions and thinking the words ominous had buried the ring hoping thus to elude the sentence denounced at random against the unlawful possessor of it and even escape the vindictive justice of heaven itself by such a precaution that if i found not every particular in regard to this ring exactly as it related it to me then i might conclude there was not a single syllable of truth in the whole and consequently no obligation lay upon me to take any further concerns in the affair engaged in this interesting and all-absorbing conversation i suddenly became aware it was very late the silence throughout the house for the first time appalled me and i was about to make a movement towards the door to make sure all was safe without when the light from the lamp once again became normal with a startled glance i looked for the phantasm it was gone nor was there any other means by which it could have taken its departure save by dematerialization bitterly disappointed my fears being now entirely removed at so abrupt a disappearance i sat down very calmly and in the coolest manner canvassed over the whole matter to myself reflected seriously on every particular and was induced to conclude from the coherence and punctuality of the account that it was impossible it should be fiction or imposture i laid particular stress upon the circumstance of the ring the singularity of its motto and the minute description of the spot where it was deposited i considered moreover from the tests i had made by shutting my eyes and pressing the balls with my forefinger that i had been perfectly awake had had the full use both of my senses and reason 
and was as capable of knowing the figure and voice of a man as the size and print of the book i was reading at the time the ghost made its appearance in short firmly persuaded of the truth of what i had heard and seen i resolved on the morrow to search for the ring and thereby clear it up beyond all possibility of doubt accordingly on monday morning early between four and five o'clock i set out alone making directly to the spot the phantasm had described found the ring without the least difficulty or delay examined the motto and date of it which corresponded exactly with his account of it and fully convinced me of my obligation to communicate to the world the particulars of the whole with this resolution immediately on my return i sat down and drew up the whole conversation as near as i could recollect neither omitting nor adding any circumstance of consequence in the manner you now see it and trusting it will prove of use to the public for whose benefit it seems intended the original manuscript to which the author appends his name concludes with a very fervid exhortation to piety coupled with an equally strong warning against indulgence in vice and crime the story of the ghost judging by the interest that is even now 1908 taken in it must have created a considerable sensation at the time so much so that i think a brief history of the crime gruesome though it be will bear repeating prior to doing so however i should like to relate a ghostly experience that happened to me elliot o'donnell in the same neighbourhood august nineteen o four the village of gisborough is on an eminence ten miles northwest by north of northampton four miles from the source of the avon at naseby ten miles northeast from daventry eleven miles from lutterworth ten miles south southwest from market harborough twelve miles east from rugby and seventy six miles from london the adjacent country consisting of large stretches of smiling meadows dales and tablelands is very fair for the eye to dwell upon and it is only at night when the shadows from the many spinneys are cast upon the gleaming roads and silent tarns or when the wind rustling through the elms and oaks sound like the breaking and falling of surf on the seashore it is only then that the place presents an entirely different aspect to the psychic mind and one conjures up ghosts during the period of my early visits to gisborough the history of the village was unknown to me nor did i for one moment associate it with superphysic manifestations till i was staying at the hamlet of creton some three miles distant and had to tramp home late at night i must confess then that i was unquestionably glad to leave the cross-roads at the top of crow hill and the lonely turnpike behind and find myself snugly ensconced within the very material precincts of the cricketer's arms the route i took led me past the long disused burial ground of some nonconformist fraternity a spot one never seemed to notice by day but which struck me as singularly eerie at night on this particular night in question i did not leave my friend's house in gisborough till close on twelve an hour when all village folk are in bed and the place is wrapped in the most profound silence the sound on my footsteps as i briskly pounded down the road echoed and re-echoed through the village i welcomed the sound it was nice to have even that for a companion i am not as a rule nervous i have been too much by myself in life to be an abject coward yet i must confess i never anticipated the walk from gisborough along the lonely turnpike road after nightfall without an uncomfortable itching in my back i was just beginning to get that sensation when i arrived at the rusty gates of the cemetery and was confounded beyond measure on seeing a curious grotesque sort of creature climb over the iron bars and confront me the moonlight was so powerful that it left nothing uncovered or concealed a frightful terror laid hold of me what in the name of heaven could it be gazing at it with a fascination as hideous as the thing itself i took in every feature the long loose limbs the thin body the huge hands and feet the little repulsive head the white fulsome pig-like face and the protruding sapphire eyes for some seconds to me an eternity we watched one another in breathless silence the elemental for as such i at length recognized it being the first to take the initiative 
the unfathomable stare in its eyes gradually deepened into a horrible and very unmistakable expression of malignant joy in which all the most undesirable of human vices seemed blended its monstrous hands rose like wings on either side of its head the fingers twitching convulsively in greedy anticipation of clutching me its legs slowly crouched as if about to spring and then just as the crucial moment arrived and the acme of my terrors was reached the spell was broken and leaden weights fell from off my feet my limbs became endowed with a thousandfold their natural elasticity and turning round i fled so ended my first and only experience with the gisborough ghost i have taken very good care since then to give that burial ground a very wide berth after nightfall but now comes the most extraordinary part of it i had heard off and on that a certain house in the village since pulled down was supposed to be haunted that one bedroom in particular had struck those occupying it as containing an invisible presence both inimical and horrible i never however associated this mysterious something with the elemental i have seen till in the course of a conversation with an old and highly respected inhabitant of the village a few days since august the tenth nineteen o eight i learned that he had had a psychical adventure of a somewhat extraordinary nature in his boyhood upon pressing him he told me that he had lived in the haunted house as a child and on running upstairs to his bedroom one morning had seen a long thin human form with a tiny head and animal's face crouching on the bed and staring at him terrified out of his wits by this unexpected and startling spectacle he had remained glued to the spot for some seconds until a slight movement on the part of the elemental broke the spell and he was able to bolt precipitately from the apartment this was the only time he saw it here then surely was the key to the nature of the haunting an elemental or poltergeist assuredly the same that had appeared to me some fifty years later at the gate of the old burial ground my informant by the way had not heard of my experience i had told it to no one hence this visual occult manifestation of mine in gisborough stands corroborated but why this haunting why this form of apparition i dived into the history of gisborough and discovered what quantities of fossils trilobites etc together with implements of flint i e arrowheads javelins celts the latter properly known as thunderbolts have been and are still found in various parts of the village and in the gravel pits of the adjoining hamlets of nortoft and hollowell that tumuli yet remain in gisborough park and in several of the neighbouring fields and that numbers of very ancient bones have been from time to time dug out of the soil in all parts of the village all this is conclusive evidence that gisborough is far older than its average inhabitant of to-day imagines that it has been alternately the site of paleolithic and neolithic settlements and that all sorts of barbaric rites and ceremonies have been conducted on the very ground where houses and cottages now stand hence it is not very surprising to any one at all versed in the modus operandi of phantasms and psychic phenomena to hear that one of the apparitions at least haunting gisborough appears in the form of a subhuman or sub-animal elemental superphysical manifestations of this kind let me explain for the benefit of the inexperience usually occur on the sites of or near ancient and unconsecrated or long disused burial places the whys and the wherefores of which i hope to dwell upon in detail in a subsequent volume part two i will now append the account of the croxford trial copied with as few alterations as possible from the pamphlet reprinted by mr henson of northampton in eighteen forty eight at the assizes held at northampton on thursday august the second seventeen sixty four came on before the right honourable the lord chief baron varker the trials of benjamin deacon john croxford and richard butlin for the murder of a travelling pedlar known only as scotty at a house of ill fame called catslow in the parish of gisborough kept by one thomas seamark who was executed at northampton on april the twenty third last for a robbery on the highway and had been a receptacle of thieves and highwaymen for some time 
the chief evidence against them was that of anne seamark widow of the above thomas seamark she deposed that some time between michaelmas and christmas last the said pedlar supposed to be one thomas corey came to the said house where were at that time the said seamark deacon croxford and butlin to whom he offered stockings etc for sale but not agreeing as to the price they proposed to murder him and directly seamark knocked him down butlin fell upon his legs deacon upon his face to prevent him crying out and croxford pulling out a knife cut his throat in such a manner that the head was almost off but the body stirring a little croxford stabbed him in the head which put an end to his life they then stripped him and carried the clothes upstairs where seamark's three children were in bed after which a hole was dug by seamark in the close adjoining to the house where they buried the body but thinking themselves not safe they dug up the body again and cut it into several pieces these latter they put into an oven and were three days and nights trying to consume them in the end succeeding only with the flesh and having to bury the bones which were now produced in court and held as testimony against them being asked by the judge why she did not reveal the same before mrs seamark answered that her husband threatened to murder her if she mentioned it to any one whilst croxford holding a knife to her throat with one hand and having a book in the other swore he would instantly kill her if she did not take an oath to conceal all knowledge of the matter the next witness for the prosecution mrs seamark's little boy of ten years of age stated that on being kicked one day at school by a playmate he had in a passion cried out that he would serve him as his daddy served scotty which statement being overheard by the schoolmaster the latter called him into his presence and demanded an explanation on the witness refusing to comply he was shut in a room by himself where he remained till the arrival of his mother in the meantime the schoolmaster who like every one else in gisborough had only known the peddler by the name of scotty and like other folk had wondered at his long absence from the village seeing that many people owed him money and others were in want of goods began to put two and two together and had arrived at the conclusion that the boy knew more than he dare tell when mrs seamark entered the house in a state of breathless alarm to know why her son had not turned up for his dinner whereupon the schoolmaster had boldly taxed her with a knowledge of scotty's fate which after no little hesitation and a great many tears she had admitted this had led to the present witness confessing that chancing to peep through the cracks of the chamber floor one afternoon he had seen his father and some other men trying to burn some hands and feet in the oven near to which were a grey coat and a cane which he recognised as belonging to scotty who had been to their house the day before on being asked by the judge if he could identify the prisoners with the men he had seen helping his father he at once answered in the affirmative this concluded his testimony after which several other witnesses whose evidence i cannot record here through lack of space were then called croxford deacon and butlin protesting their innocence of the crime laid against them declaring that the whole case had been maliciously trumped up by mrs seamark and her son after the evidence on both sides had been thoroughly examined the judge summed up and the jury after a quarter of an hour's absence returned with a verdict of wilful murder a demonstration being made by the prisoners against anne seamark as she left the court on saturday august the fourth the prisoners were carried from the jail to the place of execution guarded by a party of sir charles howard's dragoons with fixed bayonets and muskets loaded with powder and ball where they joined fervently in the prayers with the minister croxford delivering a paper to one of the attendant jailers which he desired might be published for the satisfaction of the world this document is too long to quote ad verbum a brief summary will suffice in it john croxford says that he is about twenty-three years of age and by trade a tailor that he was born at brixworth of creditable parents who gave him a liberal education and that his character and behaviour were very good until about january seventeen sixty when he got into bad company which had proved his ruin this much he confessed but denied that he had been guilty of murder benjamin deacon writes that he was born in spratton is about twenty-five years of age and by trade a sawyer that he bore a tolerably good character until about christmas last 
when he committed various crimes, but not murder. Richard Butlin testifies that he was born of respectable parents at Gisborough, had a good education, is about twenty years of age, and by trade a glover and breeches maker, that he has always borne a good character and is innocent of murder. The manuscript goes on to say that they, the said John Croxford, Benjamin Deacon and Richard Butlin, were to die the next day, being condemned on the false oath of Anne Seamark, the vilest wretch that ever appeared in a court of justice, and that there was not one word of truth in her evidence, and that of her boy, it being a hellish and malicious contrivance of theirs to take away their lives, that Croxford was never with Butlin until Gisborough Feast, which was about the 25th of October, and never was in the close with Butlin and Deacon but once, and that about the 15th of November and never in the house with them, and that in their opinion no murder had been committed. That they did not doubt but the whole affair would be brought to light, though too late to be of any service to them, and that they hoped Anne Seamark would be rewarded according to her deserts, that they would die in peace with her and with all the world, bearing her no malice, only hoping the great God would make known their innocence. The document winds up with these words, done in Northampton jail, the night before the execution as a caution to all good people we the poor unhappy sufferers do severally set our hands to this it being nothing but truth john croxford benjamin deacon richard butlin in the place of execution they behaved with great fortitude still denying their knowledge of the murder but confessing themselves guilty of many irregularities they gave much attention to the divine service and departed advising all the spectators to beware of keeping bad company and declaring that they died in peace with the world after their execution the body of croxford was carried to hallowell heath in the parish of gisborough where it was hanged in chains in a gibbet erected for that purpose the bodies of deacon and butlin being delivered to a surgeon to be dissected this concludes the history of the gisborough murder posterity concurring with the verdict of the jury, and agreeing that there were sensible and useful grounds for the appearance of the phantasm of the perjured Croxford to the chaplain of the Northampton jail. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales by Elliot O'Donnell. Chapter 8. Woolsey Abbey near Gloucester. The Dreadful Smell. Technical Form of Apparitions. Phantasms of the Dead. Source of Authenticity. Copies almost ad verbum from the ms lent me by mrs brown february nineteen o eight cause of haunting vice and premature burial my name is elizabeth rita brown i am a native of birmingham and my husband john alexander is the rector of a small parish near wolverhampton in the summer of nineteen hundred my husband who had long been ailing never having properly recovered from an attack of typhoid was obliged to take a holiday engaging a locum to do his work like the majority of clergymen his stipend was not very large and we could not consequently afford to go to any expensive place an advertisement in a well-known fashion gazette attracting our attention we at once made inquiries with the result that Woolsey Abbey became ours for three months at a practically nominal rent. Of course, it was in an extremely out of the way spot. There was no railway within six miles, and the neighborhood was dull, flat, and uninteresting. Still, we might have marveled at getting it so absurdly cheap had we not heard that money was of no object to the owner, who was a semi millionaire. We arrived early one evening in July the sun was yet visible in the sky and its dying efforts would have enhanced the meanest rural beauty i cannot say we were comfortably impressed with the building it was of course simply colossal compared with our own little home 
but so grim and grey so forlorn and forbidding and withal so inhospitable that a momentary fear seized me lest its leaden-hued and crumbling walls should prove our winding sheets the grounds overgrown with every imaginable kind of weed that here attained brobdinagian dimensions gently shelved down to the house which lay in a minute valley dank damp and dismal the funereal aspect being further augmented by clumps of giant pines and elms the shadows from which were already beginning to weigh fantastically on both walls and gables to our right almost hidden by the thick foliage of the trees and luxuriant herbage we spied the twinkling surface of a sheet of water which we subsequently learned was a tarn or lake of almost unfathomable depth and darkness the principal feature of the mansion seemed to be that of antiquity of excessive antiquity more particularly the gothic monastic dome which resting on norman columns formed the termination of the left wing the right and central portion of the house dating back i believe to henry the seventh's reign though of this i have no positive proof the lapse of ages had wrought much discoloration added to which was the disfigurement caused by lichens and minute fungi that spreading over the whole exterior hung in a fine tangled web-work from the eaves but apart from this there were no great dilapidations the masonry remained intact whilst the woodwork save for a few deep rents and indentures seemed to be in an extraordinarily good state of repair the hand of nature had apparently been peremptorily and mysteriously arrested in its work of dissolution and decay the inside of the house though not belying the mournful expectations we had formed from the exterior drew from us all exclamations of wonder and admiration never had we seen such magnificent oak panelling nor such exquisitely carved ceilings nor such vast stretches of tapestry worn and faded though it was whilst the ebon blackness of the floors and the size and massiveness of the furniture were what we had hitherto only associated with the grandeur of a palace or a castle my daughters mary and eunice were charmed and impressed and both my husband and i felt our misgivings rapidly diminish when a few minutes later we were enjoying a dainty and well-cooked supper in one of the large and stately reception rooms the first days of our sojourn there passed with the pleasant monotony of well-earned rest we rambled through the long and staggering and seemingly interminable corridors of the house and about the grounds and gardens finding much to marvel at much to envy in the daytime the sun struggling feebly through the trellised panes of glass filled the rooms and passages with a crimson glow a glow both warming and enriching but at various times and in certain places startlingly and horribly suggestive of blood the analogy struck me the more forcibly each day i observed it so much so that i grew afraid to ascend the staircases alone mary and eunice laughed at my misgivings to them the house and surroundings were the quintessence of medieval splendor and romance they reveled in the grandeur of the interior trappings in the freedom of the vast park and gardens it was only after the third week that they too suddenly grew afraid but whereas my fears had been prompted by a comparison a comparison which however near and repellent still remained a comparison theirs were generated by something which although scarcely more tangible was unmistakably real they were constantly assailed by a smell a cold icy cold pungent beastly smell that would on some occasions approach them along a corridor or staircase and at others steal surreptitiously behind them from some obscure nook or cranny it was foul pestilential inexplicable they had never smelt anything like it before it was nothing recognizable it neither emanated from drainage nor from dead animals behind the skirting boards it was nauseous suffocating freezing and as if it lived it moved from the moment they first became aware of its presence their pleasure in the house ceased 
all their time was now spent in the garden but in that part of the garden only whence no view of the tarn could be obtained and where there were no trees neither my husband nor i had encountered the smell but it was not very long before the servants did and one by one they left nor could we find any that were willing to take their place the abbey bearing a very evil reputation in the neighbourhood the question of our daughter's health began to cause us some anxiety were we doing right in remaining in the house and exposing them to the danger of some serious malady for although the origin of the smell was a mystery the effect of so horrible a stench could not prove otherwise than injurious we decided therefore to give up our tenancy at the expiration of another week the idea of quitting such palatial quarters and retiring to the meanness of some petty villa or four-room cottage not disturbing us half as much as our inability to arrive at the cause of that smell in the silence of the night when no other sounds were to be heard save the gentle beating of the branches against our window and the occasional hooting of an owl we lay awake and wondered wondered why it never came to us but always to mary and eunice the house i have said was liberally furnished both rooms and passages were covered with soft if somewhat faded carpets there was no lack of tables couches chairs etc whilst the walls were adorned with pictures which though darkened by dust and blistered by the sun revealed the art of old and well-known masters but it was the library that attracted and pleased us most there arranged methodically in the ample bookcases were volumes of every description books of ancient lore spectators tatler's richardson's pamela defoe's moll of flanders tyndall's bible dryden's and gifford's translations from the classics the mysticisms of swedenborg beamham and plotinus and countless others many even of greater rarity and value bound uniformly in those covers of rich moroccan leather so characteristic of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries one among all others had riveted our attention from the very first i had already alluded to the peculiar and ghastly phenomenon produced by the sun's rays penetrating the coloured glass in the corridors and on the staircases here it was even more pronounced though only very locally the full force of the rays being focused in the most startling manner on the metal clasp of a volume of stupendous size and apparently vast antiquity the result being that whereas the entire book was bathed in a bloody halo the others were left in a comparatively clear and normal light appalled yet fascinated by this unaccountable anomaly we had several times attempted to remove the volume in order to pry into its contents but we were unable to do so owing we imagined to its having stuck or being fastened in some peculiar manner to the shelf and we were afraid to use any great force for fear of damaging the cover consequently our curiosity had to remain unsatisfied the night however preceding our departure from the abbey august eleven my husband had already left by a midday train i was whiling away the few remaining hours in the study mary and eunice being as i thought engaged in packing when suddenly i heard some one approach the door as if on tiptoe the next moment there came a loud knock and the sonorous sound of the grandfather clock in the alcove beside me commencing to strike seven the two noises were almost simultaneous wondering who my visitor could be our only servant a woman from the nearest village having left an hour ago i smoothed my gown and walking hastily to the door threw it open as i did so a current of cold air tainted with the most disgusting and detestable stench conceivable sent me half staggering half choking backwards and i perceived standing on the threshold not ten paces from me two figures of hellish horror 
featureless fleshless foul clad in the tattered rotted garments of a monk and nun they confronted me motionless silent and then the voice of my eunice attracting their attention they slowly wheeled round and glided ghoulishly along the passage i gave one shriek of warning to eunice as she hove in sight carrying in her arms a tray of odds and ends for me to sort for a second or so she stood too petrified to move and then as the things appeared on the verge of touching her with their long outstretched arms she dropped the tray and uttering a kind of terrified gasp fled precipitately they did not pursue her but gliding onward with the same mechanical movements suddenly vanished on reaching the wall at the end of the corridor nor did we i am thankful to say see them again the smell had explained itself anxious to get to eunice and fearsome lest she should have fainted i was about to quit the study when my eyes were attracted to an object on the floor it was the mysterious volume which loosened from the shelf in some miraculous fashion had fallen to the ground and now lay open its ponderous gilded clasps undone and limp the fading sunlight concentrating its rays on the pages of the book in a final and prodigiously bloody effort enabled me to read the following extract and for this great and unpardonable sin of the abbess hilda and the monk nicholas we the saintly and beloved abbot matthew the learned franciscan brother raymond the layman and laborers barber and brooks together with i sir john hickson lee knight did entomb them alive clasped in each other's arms cursing man and blaspheming heaven on the eve of the eleventh day of august fifteen twenty one and of the exact spot in the abbey of wolsey wherein they be buried no man save we who place them there knoweth nor shall any discover the same until the day cometh when the secrets of all flesh shall be revealed this much i read and no more for the light proving too strong for me i was compelled to remove my gaze and when i opened my eyes and saw again the volume it had gone and lo to my intense and unfeigned amazement it was back again in its customary place on the shelf nor could the united efforts of myself and daughters remove it from that spot regarding this extraordinary incident as the only feasible explanation of the phenomena eunice and i had seen we could arrive at no other conclusion than that the house once wolsey abbey was haunted by the phantasms of the abbess hilda and the monk nicholas and with such an explanation we have had to be content end of chapter eight recording by john brandon chapter nine of some haunted houses of england and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson some haunted houses of england and wales by elliot o'donnell number x y z euston road the little old woman in the heliotrope skirt technical form of apparition phantasm of the dead source of authenticity personal experience of author cause of haunting murder of all the most annoying things in this world few are more than missing one's train especially when it happens to be the last in the day this unpleasant experience happened to me one evening early in september eighteen ninety five i came into euston just as the seven p m for northampton the last train connected with brixworth was steaming out of the station and so willy-nilly i had to remain in town all night where to put up 
now became the absorbing question i wanted to be close to the station in order to catch the earliest morning train but although there was plenty of rich men's hotels there seemed a sore dearth of go-betweens it was either five shillings the night or sixpence purgatory or hell i could see no place that suited me at last after traversing many squares and the more respectable of the side streets i retraced my steps eventually alighting on a private and inconsequential looking hotel in euston road the interior of the establishment was in keeping with the exterior gloomy and forbidding and the damp earthy smell that seemed to rise from the basement made me gravely apprehensive of rheumatism still the tariff was in strict accordance with my means and feeling too tired to wander further i decided to remain the room in which i had a very sparse supper was like the majority of dining-rooms in middle-class hotels overcrowded with unwieldy furniture frowsy ill-ventilated imagine that the table had been laid once and for all it had undoubtedly presented the same spectacle for months and that the cloth never very white was removed only when it grew too begrimed even for the blunted susceptibilities of the proprietress i afterwards found that the beef did not belie its looks that the bread was in excellent accord and that the water might well have been the receptacle of innumerable generations of bacilli there were other visitors besides myself either germans or commercial travellers probably both but as their conversation carried on over plates of half raw meat was neither particularly edifying nor interesting i preferred an antique number of vanity fair until at length tiring of that i picked up a candlestick and made my way to bed the moment i crossed the threshold of my room that peculiar and indefinable sensation that invariably suggests the immediate proximity of the superphysical came over me i felt sure the house was haunted but by what ah that was the problem left for me to solve the furniture of the room was of the orthodox lodging-house type inartistic scant and seedy a gaunt four-poster propped against the middle of the wall running at right angles to the door was adorned with exceedingly dirty valances of nondescript pink and white pattern facing this was a fireplace with register of which was of course down to the left of this was a hanging wardrobe that i at once examined and found to contain nothing more formidable than a score or two of black beetles that scuttled unceremoniously away into holes at the side of my candle whilst on the opposite side of the room facing the window was a rickety dressing-table surmounted by a still more rickety-looking glass in one corner of the room stood a washing-stand from which the white paint had peeled in a hundred places and in the other corner a dismantled bureau that resembled some vessel after a great storm these i believe apart from a couple of cane bottom chairs constituted the entire furniture nor can i say this scantiness taking into consideration the poorness of the quality was any matter of regret the carpet undoubtedly the best feature of the room and either an axminster or a brussels not being an expert on such a point i cannot tell which hid all the boarding save where the margins were stained with a preparation of potash i give all these details to show that several years of practical investigation of haunted houses had developed my inquiring faculties to a very high degree little if anything escaping my notice the raison d'etre of ghosts often lies where it is least expected in some article of furniture not infrequently a cupboard near at hand in the panelling in the skirting or not infrequently again on or under the boards when i am in a haunted room my first instinct therefore is to take a very careful stock of my surroundings the bare appearance or touch of a piece of furniture often supplying me with the necessary clue on this occasion however nothing arousing my suspicions and feeling abnormally sleepy i bolted my door and lay on the bed i say on not in as a cursory glance at the pillow made me draw deductions as to the sheets 
within a few minutes i went to sleep falling into a heavy dreamless slumber from which i was suddenly and most alarmingly awakened by the feeling that i was no longer alone in the room opening my eyes i perceived the apartment flooded with a bright unnatural light that apparently emanated from or at all events accompanied the figure of a little old woman with yellow hair and a heliotrope skirt i noticed these idiosyncrasies of person and dress directly the nature of the light accentuating them and my senses being as they always are in the presence of superphysical phenomena wonderfully and painfully acute standing in front of the dressing-table the eccentric individual was examining herself with the greatest curiosity in the crazy looking-glass to which allusion has already been made her profile was angular her lack of color ghastly whilst from her ears hung that style of drop earring worn by ladies in the days of the crinoline otherwise her costume might have belonged to the latter seventies or early eighties there was nothing actually horrible about her save her reflection and as my eyes turned with irresistible fascination towards the looking-glass my blood turned to ice the surface of the mirror made preternaturally bright flashed back the most hideous the most incomparably hideous image of fear never never in all my life had i seen depicted in aught but wirtz's pictures such inconceivably awful terror as that which confronted one there and now as i gazed at it a sickly curiosity seized me as to what could be the origin of such hellish fear was it fear of death of the unknown metetherical abysses of eternal damnation of what then as i followed the direction of the dilating pupils i saw god help me the cause descending from a few inches above her head were the snake-like coils of a rope had i been able to turn my head maybe i should have seen whence they came but i could not move a muscle and could only feel the keynote to some great and hitherto unsolvable mystery was at hand but purposely hidden from me there was scant time for speculation the enactment of this drama was brief as it was lurid uttering an appalling scream that was quickly converted into a gurgle of the most blood-curdling significance the old lady clawed the air with her spidery fingers the murderer was pitiless the noose coming to with an irresistible snap jerked the wretched victim off her feet and for one instant the most harrowing of all i watched her falling backwards watched the changing of her deadly pallor into a deep and vivid purple watched the rolling of her starting eyeballs the foam flakes on her lips and the frenzied movements of her stiffening arms and then then as she struck the ground with a reverberating crash all was darkness the ghostly tragedy for this night at least was over then i realized but my nerves being too completely unstrung by what i had witnessed to allow me to sleep i crept under the counterpane and lay there shivering till the welcome rays of early dawn converted the room into another place my first movement was to examine the scene of the ghostly murder and upon turning up the carpet i discovered not a blood-stain but a comparatively new piece of boarding with that drawing my own conclusions i had to rest content there was nothing else in the room that could in any way have been transmuted into evidence the moment the clock struck six i picked up my valise and gobbling down a lukewarm breakfast with little relish quitted the house determining to pay it another visit before very long in this however i was doomed to disappointment some months elapsed before i could again visit the neighbourhood of euston and when i did so i found the hotel had vanished nor have i to this day been able to identify the house wherein i slept i have but lately been informed that a good many years ago when we middle-aged fogies were mere children 
a singularly repulsive murder was committed at a house in or near euston road the victim being a somewhat extraordinary old lady further details i do not know therefore i can only surmise that what i saw may possibly have been her phantasm but please remember it is only a surmise end of chapter nine Section 10 of Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jesse Blankenship. Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales by Elliot O'Donnell. Section 10 burl farm north devon the headless dog and the evil tree technical form of apparitions elemental source of authenticity first-hand evidence cause of hauntings unknown between my exit from the stage in 1900 up till quite recently i had the great the very great misfortune to be a teacher in a small town in the north of england i say misfortune because i found the contrasts between exciting stage land and the monotonous schoolroom between the generous and jovial theatrical fraternity and the mean and petty local parents too decidedly pronounced to be other than excessively unpleasant I had small patience with the mediocre abilities of very mediocre children, and still less with the continual and unwarrantable interference of their ill-mannered and doting mothers. No lot in life could have been more thoroughly uncongenial than mine. Indeed, it would have soon become unbearable had it not been for the constant influx of strangers whose presence in the town made an oasis in the desert. It is to one of these visitors, Miss Medley, that I owe the following story. Some years ago, she began, I received an invitation to spend August with a very crotchety old aunt of mine residing at Burl Farm, North Devon. There was nothing at all extraordinary in the appearance of the house. It belonged to a type common in all parts of England. It was a low, rambling building of yellow stone with a good substantial thatched roof and ample stabling the rooms sweet with the scent of jasmine and honeysuckle compared more than favorably with the stuffy dens in which i had been obliged to live in london whilst the diamond-shaped window panes and massive oak beams serving as supports to the ceilings struck me as being quite delightfully quaint my aunt, too, a rosy-faced old lady in a mob cap, appeared quite in harmony with her surroundings. She was kindness itself. Indeed, no one could have made me feel more thoroughly at home. Folks do say the house is haunted, she laughed. Particularly one room. But there, I have never seen anything, and I don't suppose you will. A ghost, I cried. How awfully exciting! oh do let me sleep in the haunted room and i continued to plead till the kind-hearted old lady reluctantly consented you mustn't blame me if the ghost should visit you rosie she said remember i have warned you there is nothing i should enjoy better than seeing a real bona fide spook auntie dear i rejoined smiling but my aunt shook her head reprovingly and no more was said on the subject until the next day. I awoke that night as the clock struck two. Indeed, I fancied my awakening was due to that striking. It seemed so unusually loud and emphatic. It was a fine, indeed, I might say glorious, night, for although there was no moon, the heavens were so brilliantly illuminated with myriads of scintillating stars that I could see every object around me almost as clearly as if it had been day. 
A sudden movement near the foot of the bed made me recollect my aunt's admonition. I listened, experiencing none of those pleasant anticipations of which I had spoken so boastfully. I knew no one could have entered the room, as I had taken the precaution to lock the door. Having first of all looked under the bed and made quite a thorough examination of the hanging wardrobe, Consequently, my visitor, unless a mouse or a rat, could be nothing material. I devoutly wished I had slept in one of the other rooms. A faint and sickly odor now became perceptible, whilst the noise hitherto uninterpretable developed into a series of unequal knocks, just as if some big animal were lying on the floor scratching itself. Determined not to appear frightened, I put my hand out of bed and called, Trot! Trot! Is that you? Trot being the name of my auntie's retriever. Something instantly jumped up and, coming round the bed, stood by my side. Wondering whether it could be Trot, though at a loss to understand how he could have got into the room without being seen, I stretched out my fingers and to my intense relief touched a furry coat the stench at the same time becoming so truly awful that I retched. I could, of course, have satisfied myself as to the identity of my visitor by merely looking, but this, I am ashamed to say, I was too great a coward to do, a strange feeling telling me that I was in the presence of something unnatural. Running my hand fearfully along the shaggy skin of the animal, I felt for its head, discovering to my intense horror that it had none, the neck terminating in a wet mass of something soft and spongy. Unable to restrain myself any longer, I now looked, perceiving to my infinite terror a huge shock-haired spaniel, headless and in the most abominable state of decomposition. I gazed at it for some seconds, too appalled either to stir or utter a sound, this paralytic condition continuing till an abortive effort of the phantasm to jump on the bed loosened my tongue and I shrieked for help. The dog immediately vanished. My feelings had been, however, so outraged by what I had witnessed that nothing would have induced me to pass the remainder of that night in that room. My own idea was to get out of it with the utmost celerity. I did so. Nor did I ever again, not even by daylight, venture to cross its threshold. My aunt, poor dear, was very much upset at the occurrence. She could not imagine how it was other people could see the ghost while she could not, and her skepticism was but natural. She was unable to grasp the idea that the psychic faculty is a gift only granted to the few, and as rare as that either of music or painting. Other reasons for her incredulity in this particular occult manifestation lay in the enigmatical nature and purport of the phenomenon. In what category of ghosts would one classify a headless dog? Was it the spirit of a dog that had been decapitated on earth? She had never gathered from the scriptures that beasts had souls. What then was this phantom of a dog? I suggested it might be a poltergeist or elemental, one of those purely bestial creations that for various reasons which you explained at your recent lecture always haunt certain localities. Yes, I said, interrupting Miss Medley. The sub-animal type of elemental is fairly common. If you refer to the June number 1908 of the magazine published by the Society for Psychical Research, you will see an extremely well-authenticated case of the haunting of a village by a white pig with an abnormally long snout, and I could enumerate many other similar instances, but continue. My aunt, Miss Medley went on, informed me that the house had once been occupied by a lady who had lived a very selfish, not to say sensual life. She had settled down at Burl, after having been divorced twice, and her weekly routine was one incessant whirl of pleasure. She died without the consolation of the church, 
surrounded by a crowd of fawning money hunters and overgorged poodles, so that for this, as well as other reasons, I think there may be an alternative solution to the haunting. Is it not possible that which I saw was actually the spirit of this worldly woman, which thoroughly brutalized by long indulgence and sensuality had gradually adapted the shape most befitting it? And the moral of that, Miss Medley, I observed, is, if you do not wish to become a beast, do not live like one. Yes, there is much to be learned from a study of the different types of phantasms, more, I believe, than from any pulpit discourses. Is that your only psychic experience? Miss Medley shook her head. No, she said. I had another very gruesome one at Burl. After the dog episode, my aunt thought fit to warn me not to pass along a certain road after dusk. There is an elm standing close to it, she said, which the people about here declare to be haunted. As you have seen one ghost, you may see another. So please be careful. Now, you may think that after such a disagreeable experience, I would have followed my aunt's advice. But curiosity getting the better of discretion, I disobeyed her and, selecting a fine evening for the enterprise, set out to the tree. As it was two or three miles away, and I was dearly fond of riding, I hired a horse, and going along, at a jog trot, approached the forbidden spot at about eight o'clock. The lane in which the haunted elm stood was narrow. Trees of all sorts and sizes lined it on either side, and the shadows, intensified by the thickness of the foliage overhead, almost obliterated the roadway. All was dark and silent. I no longer wondered at the villagers fighting shy of such a place. It looked a positive cockpit of spookdom. At about twenty or so yards from the notorious elm, my horse showed unmistakable signs of uneasiness, laying back its ears and shivering to such an extent that it was only by dint of alternate threats and caresses that I succeeded in urging it forward. Arriving at a spot level with the tree, the animal shied, and had I not been a pretty good horsewoman, I might have met with a nasty accident. But I stuck to my seat like a leech, and using my whip smartly drew in the reins. My horse fell back on its haunches, reared, plunged headlong forward, took the bit between its teeth, and we were off like the wind. Fortunately, I was prepared, leaning back in my saddle, I enjoyed, rather than otherwise, so mad a career. But my pleasure received a sudden check when I perceived, to my horror, the figure of a tall woman dressed in black striding along by the side of us and keeping pace with us without any apparent effort. Heaven alone knew where she came from, unless she came from the tree. I fancied I had heard something drop from the branches at the moment my horse shied. As the woman was wearing a cloak drawn over her head, I could not see her face, but from the grotesque outlines of her limbs and body, I concluded it must be unpleasantly bizarre. We kept together in this extraordinary fashion until we came in sight of Burl, when she quickened her steps, and tearing off the hood thrust her face upwards into mine. It was awful, utterly and inconceivably awful, so awful that I felt the very marrow in my bones freeze with horror while my heart stood still. She had no hair. Her head was round and shiny, whilst her face, yellow and swollen, was covered all over with circular black spots causing it to bear a striking resemblance to one of those old-fashioned carriage dogs. Her eyes were black and sinister. She had no nose, whilst her mouth was horrid, the most horrid thing about her. With a diabolical grin, she grabbed at my jacket, and would, I believe, have torn me from my seat had we not at this moment, in the very nick of time, arrived within sight of the gates of Burl Farm. My aunt, with several other people, was awaiting me, and as with a desperate spurt I galloped up to them, 
the infernal hag let go her hold of my jacket, slackened her pace, and vanished. End of section 10. Recording by Jesse Blankenship. Chapter 11 of Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Some Haunted Houses of England and Wales by Elliot O'Donnell. Panmore Hollow, Marioneth, the Black Peddler. Technical form of apparition, phantasm of the dead. Source of authenticity, ladies' cabinet, 1835 and elsewhere. Cause of haunting, murder. The ladies' cabinet for 1835 contains an account of a haunting in Marioneth that seems to me of sufficient psychic interest to record. Hence, I append it but since the original title is a trifle too intricate in places, I have taken the liberty to tell the story more or less in my own words. In the summer of 1832 I was on a walking tour in Wales in selecting as the principal scene of my operations Marioneth, and chancing one evening to be overtaken by a storm when midway between Dalgelly and Bela, I was speedily placed in the most unpleasant of predicaments. To go on, I was afraid. To turn back was impossible. What could I do? The night was dark, the rain almost tropical, and the roadway so broken up with furrows that I could only grope along with the utmost difficulty, whilst the frequent windings, steep ascents, and sharp declivities not only added to my embarrassment, but greatly increased my weariness and every few yards I either plunged into a miniature morass, or, stumbling over a boulder, found myself smarting in the centre of a gorse-bush. At length I grew desperate. Human nature could stand it no longer, and, resolving to perish with the cold rather than flounder on under such pitiable conditions, I threw myself down on a rock, and prepared to lie there till daybreak. It is possible I had remained in this position for ten or so minutes, when I was roused to a sense of deliverance by the bright glow of a lamp, and starting up to my feet I discovered I was no longer alone. Confronting me was the figure of a short man, wrapped in a shaggy greatcoat and wearing a slouched hat. He was holding a lantern in his hand. By a series of pantomimic gestures he assured me that his intentions were amicable, and that he was anxious to guide me to some place of shelter where I should have a more comfortable pallet than a bare rock. I accepted his offer, though not without some misgivings, as I could not remember ever having met with anyone quite so uncouth or bizarre. Turning abruptly to the right, he struck across a wide moor, covered with gorse and innumerable boulders, and so studded with pools of water that I seemed to be in a perpetual state of wading. Emerging from this, we wended our way along the side of a precipice, at the bottom of which roared one of those mountain torrents so characteristic of all parts of Wales. Beckoning to me to follow, my guide mysteriously disappeared, and peering over the edge of the chasm, I perceived him, to my amazement, making his descent by an almost invisible and perpendicular pathway. For a second or so I hesitated, and then, making up my mind to brave anything, rather than remain by myself in such an unfamiliar and dangerous neighbourhood, I gingerly lowered myself over the brink, and after a few tumbles succeeded in overtaking him just as he arrived at the bottom. We now found ourselves in a valley of Stygian darkness, and of such restricted dimensions that the spray from the river bathed me from head to foot. My companion pressed resolutely on, and maintaining the same extraordinary and uncanny silence, conducted me to a recess in the hillside where the outlines of a bare, dismantled house gradually arose to greet us. It was merely a pile of ruins, 
old yet naked without any of those evidences of vegetation one usually associates with the antique i particularly noticed this deficiency it impressed and perplexed me if moss and lichens grew elsewhere why not here the situation of the house was strikingly romantic and weird indeed one could not well imagine a more dismal spot a giant mass of black rock reared itself in the background like a brobdingnagian bat in the foreground and at so close a distance that the spray blowing madly over my face and clothes drenched me to the skin rushed a seething mass of sable water whilst to accentuate all of this avernian horror the wind whistled demoniacally and the rain fell with ever-increasing fury turning to my guide i impatiently requested him to move on and take me with the greatest expedition to the nearest available hostelry in reply he took off his hat and thrusting his monstrous head forward revealed to my horror-stricken gaze a shapeless sodden mass of black flesh the cause of his silence was now obvious he couldn't speak because he had no mouth but neither had he eyes ears or nose nothing but that awful unmeaning rotund protuberance i stood aghast too terrified to stir almost too terrified to breathe with the hideous thing looming there before me and the booming of the river behind it was a ghastly situation the creature advanced an inch my blood turned to ice it raised its arms my soul sickened within me it lunged suddenly forward and fell right through me as it did so i heard a fiendish chuckle which dying slowly out gave way to a succession of blood-curdling groans that seemed to proceed from the interior of the ruins the figure however was nowhere to be seen it must have dematerialized on the spot very much relieved at this though still considerably frightened i was now able to use my limbs and turning my back on the ghostly building i felt my way along the bank of the river i dare not glance at the boiling foam the very sound of it made my flesh creep nor did i feel in any degree safe till a winding of the footpath brought me to a bridge on the opposite side of which i saw the twinkling lights of many houses i was now once again in the land of the living and a substantial meal by a cosy fire helped in a good measure to dissipate my fears and recompense me for all the trials i had undergone prior to leaving the inn the next day i learned from my host that the hollow was known to be haunted and on that account was universally shunned after sunset half a century ago the ruins then a neat grey cottage had been inhabited by the evanses a bad thriftless lot at the instigation of her husband and with a motive of robbery mrs evans a buxom woman handsome in a bad bold style had flirted openly with a peddler known locally as black dave this man was easily induced to put up at their house and his suspicions being lulled to rest by the amorous overtures of the woman he was surprised in his sleep and butchered fearing however either to commit the body to the river or bury it in their garden lest it should be found and being at the same time very hard pressed for food they improvised an oven in the earth and ate it the vengeance of heaven was however close on their track the cottage paid for out of their ill-gotten gains caught fire during a drunken carousal and mrs evans was burned to death whilst her husband only lingered long enough to make a full confession of the crime the house was never rebuilt the phantasm of dave in the disgusting guise in which he appeared to me still haunts the precincts and delighting to gull unsuspecting wayfarers leads them out of their proper courses guiding them with a fiendish skill to the black ruin the scene of his ghastly murder End of chapter 11